What are you, Dr. Rohit? Hi, Sanjay. Are we okay to kick this off? Yep. Welcome, everyone, to our pre-conference webinar titled Artificial Intelligence, Machine Learning, and analytics in transforming quality healthcare delivery. It's an exciting precursor to the conversations and innovations that will be showcased at THIT 2024. Today's discussion is, is uh, today's session is not just a discussion, uh, it's a glimpse of the future of healthcare, a future where technology is at the forefront of transforming how we understand, manage, and deliver care. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone joining us from wherever on the globe you are. I am Dr. Rohit Rao, AVPIT at Apollo Hospitals. I lead digital transformation for oncology and analytics for the enterprise. Today, we are joined by two fantastic speakers, and I will introduce them shortly. But let me just give you a brief on our session today. In an era where data is as critical as care itself, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and analytics have become pillars upon which the future of healthcare rests. These technologies offer us unprecedented insight into outcomes, personalized care, and ultimately serve to drive quality and efficiency of healthcare across the globe. As we navigate our discussions, we will explore the vast potential of these technologies that are poised to revolutionize our healthcare systems. Our speakers will also delve into real world applications, challenges, and ethical considerations of integrating these technologies into our practices. Our aim is to provide a 360 degree view of how these innovations can not only enhance patient outcomes, but also drive efficiency and, and make quality healthcare accessible to all. So this webinar sets the stage for THIT 2024, where we will continue to explore these theme themes in greater detail. We are on the tipping point of a new era in healthcare, and the insights shared today will pave the way for more in-depth discussions and collaborations at the conference. Without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker, Dr. Puneet Mehta. Uh, Dr. Puneet is a seasoned healthcare executive with expertise in hospital operations, strategic initiatives, and a passion to improve access healthcare globally. He spearheads strategy and business development efforts for international projects at Apollo Hospitals and has pedigree in managing PLs for leading healthcare brands in India and the Middle East. His educational foundation is as a Bachelor of Medicine in Surgery, an MBA from IMT Ghaziabad, with advanced uh, training and programs from Ames, New Delhi, and HMS. He combines medical knowledge with his business leadership, and he is committed to reducing global healthcare disparities through automation and innovation to make healthcare more accessible and affordable to everyone. It is my pleasure to invite Dr. Mehta to open this webinar and share his perspectives on the role of AI, ML, and analytics in the transformation of healthcare. Over to you, Dr. Puneet. Thanks, Dr. Rohit, for the introduction. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Just allow me a moment. I'm putting up my slides. Rohit, is that visible? Just a second. Yeah. All right. So today, 
I speak here to shed light on revolutionary transformation occurring in the realm of healthcare with integration of artificial intelligence. The fusion of AI and healthcare represents a paradigm shift promising unparalleled advancements in diagnosis, treatment, and patient care. AI's entry into healthcare isn't about technological innovation. It's about enhancing human capabilities, augmenting expertise, and ultimately saving more lives. One of the most striking applications of AI in healthcare lies in medical imaging, which we are all seeing uh, happening around us. Through deep learning algorithms, AI can analyze complex images like MRI, CT scans, X-rays with remarkable accuracy and speed. This enables early detection of diseases such as cancer, allowing for prompt interventions and improved outcomes. Moreover, AI predictive analytics is reshaping how we approach patient care. By analyzing vast amount of patient data, AI can identify patterns, predict disease progressions, and even anticipate potential complications. This proactive approach not only optimizes treatment plans, but also enables healthcare providers to deliver personalized care tailored to each individual clinic. Furthermore, AI-driven healthcare virtual health assistants are revolutionizing the patient experience. These intelligent agents can provide round-the-clock support, answering queries, scheduling appointments, and offering personalized health recommendations. By streamlining administrative tasks, they free up valuable time for healthcare professionals to focus on direct patient care, enhancing overall efficiency and satisfaction. The integration of AI in healthcare holds immense promise, offering transformative solutions to some of the most pressing challenges faced in the faced by the industry. By harnessing the power of AI, we have the opportunity to revolutionize healthcare delivery, improve patient outcomes, and ultimately to save a lot more lives. So, starting with some basics, I would like to give a disclaimer here that I'm not an IT person. So this discussion will restrict to a very generic one, something that a layman like me can understand and relate. So what is AI? Artificial intelligence is a process of incorporating human intelligence to machines using a set of rules or algorithms. It is about teaching machines to mimic human brain and think. It focuses on three aspects, learning, reasoning, and self correction Machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence. It is, it is a study of processes which enables the computer to learn automatically on its own through its experiences without explicit programming. More on that, we'll cover in the next slide. Deep learning is a subset of ML, which involves something called as neural networks. So from what we can understand it as, it's like Information networks arranged, in, arranged just like neurons of the brain, which helps the computer to imitate functionality like the human brain. So types of algos used in ML are basically, class, can be basically classified or grouped under supervised, unsupervised, and the semi-supervised, which is a mix of the two. Supervised ones are the types wherein we use label data like X-rays uh, which have uh, known tumors. This is which it can de the the machine can the computer can detect anomalies, detect tumors in newer images. So unsupervised is something like the information you know it ex extracts information out of data without any labels. So it's like a, a group of patient data with similar symptoms to identify a co common cause, which is particularly very helpful these days we have seen in epidemiological studies very recently. Which we have. So I'll cover the types of AI that we uh, use in the non-clinical setting is what I'll focus on. And my colleague, Dr. Sujoy, shall cover the clinical use of this part. So this common types of AI that we use in the non-clinical settings can be classified as generative AI. It's a type of artificial intelligence technologies that can produce various types of content, including text, imagery, audio, and synthetic data. So most of your chat, GPT, and DALI fall in, fall in this category. Some of the healthcare use cases include automating administrative tasks, facilitating medical training and simulation. So for those of you who might be interested, Apollo has a 
beautiful simulation center of facility located in Varadaram in Chennai, if you'd like to. The other type is predictive AI. It uses historical data analysis to predict future events and trends and anticipate the needs. We could use that for resource allocation and for uh, radiological image analysis. The next type that we cover is uh, that we see are uh, disease progression models. This is basically the clinical side of things where uh, Dr. Sujoy would cover more, which is more about evaluating the chronic disease progression. Then there is image analytics, which is a type of predictive analytics that analyzes medical images and detects abnormalities or subtle changes that may not be really visible to the human eye to detect. So there are use cases in uh, X-rays which are being employed. Apollo has launched something in the tuberculosis side for detection. I have a friend of mine who's working on identifying diabetic retinopathy using cellular things. So then there is another usage which is in the enhancing the patient experience side. So the non-clinical uses would be administrative, would be could be used for administrative efficiency, appointment scheduling, billing, claims processing, inventory management. Those are some of the things that can use uh, predictive analytics and automation. Resource allocation could enhance your operational efficiency, reduce your wait times, ultimately enhances the quality of care being delivered to the patient. Patient engagement, we have various AI-powered tools which enable healthcare providers to deliver personalized patient experience. Data-driven decision-making, which could be used for identifying trends, detecting anomalies, or forecasting future needs. It uh, uses the uh, decision-making power of analytics and empower the healthcare leaders to allocate resources effectively, which ultimately leads to enhancing of your operational efficiencies and delivering high quality. Hey, Puneet. Yeah. yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, your voice seems to be breaking slightly, so maybe try and speak up a bit louder. Okay, we'll do that. So uh, the next step is, uh, the next use is improve quality and safety. Am I audible, Rohit? Yeah, much better. Thank you. Okay. So the next use is on the improved quality and safety so by proactively identifying potential risk, healthcare providers can target interventions to improve patient safety and reduce preventable harm. So this is, we have really covered some of the use case scenarios already, and I'll just skip this part, move to the next. These are some of the use case scenarios across the industries. For those of you interested, I believe this slide would be uploaded or I'll upload them to my LinkedIn if anybody This brings us to an interesting discussion. Will AI take over my job? Now that's something which everybody is really talking about these days. With all due respect to our friends in the IT sector who are facing the heat of job losses due to AI, I still have a positive outlook for our industry. There is something called as Gartner's hype cycle. Now, what this says is that uh, for every new technology, there is, it starts with a trigger, there, there is a peak of inflated expectations, and that's where I see healthcare AI is that right now, which is the, and it is slowly moving towards the trough of disillusionment is what I believe, especially in the post-COVID world with, you know, after the initial success with vaccine and the drug delivery part. So some of the routine mechanical tasks may get automated. However, most of the art and science of medicine is something that will persist and the job will be there for us, at least for our lifetimes is what I think. And that's that's just my opinion. I found this interesting table on timelines for AI in healthcare, which basically says that in the short term, in zero five years, AI shall automate time consuming high volume repetitive tasks. In the medium five to 10 years term, AI should help with driving precision therapeutics. Now, since this table is a little aged one, this is where I believe we are at right now. And in the longer term, over 10 years, AI shall help healthcare systems to achieve a state of precision medicine through AI augmented healthcare and connected care. So I leave you all with this quote from the genius along with the QR code to my LinkedIn profile if anybody is interested. Thank you all. Handing over back to you, Rohit. Thanks, Puneet. Uh, um...
audience, if you are, uh, if you have any questions, please do ping into the chat. Uh, Dr. Sanjay, I hope chat has been enabled for everyone. Yes, yes. Yeah, let's let's make sure they're able to communicate on chat. Um, we will uh, aim to answer some of those questions, if not all. Uh, we'd like to keep this as interactive as possible. Uh, in the meantime, I think I'm going to just take two minutes to ask you all to ping into the chat very quickly uh, what you believe is a key area of healthcare that will most benefit in the next five years. I've pinged it. I've pinged the question into the chat. Uh, I'd love to hear people's ideas on what they believe is an area that will benefit the most from AI and ML in the next five years. Puneet, given that you have just finished your 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 uh, talk, um, can you give your perspective on this? And also, do you mind keeping your video on? Sure. So yeah, so my perspective on this, I think I did cover in my in the last couple of slides. So I believe the area that it will most uh, add benefit to in the non-clinical setting is what I'm talking about. So would be uh, definitely in the patient experience and enhancement and connected care side, connected care technology is what I believe would be the most important aspect or the area that will be that will be. Yes. Interesting. We have uh, some participants talking about remote patient monitoring and home health care where AI is expected to disrupt. Um, and we have image analytics as another area uh, yeah, so which yes, AI is expected to Yeah, image disrupt. analytics, yes. But uh, again, so that's the clinical side. I'll leave Sujoy to talk about it. Uh, but yes, connected care, and we're seeing a lot of all these variables and connected care technologies coming up, and I believe that's where it will create a lot of access to healthcare and improve, take it to deeper regions of the of, of the society of the world. Brilliant. Good to hear those thoughts. Um, let's segue to our next speaker, Dr. Sujoy. Uh, Carr, who serves as Chief Medical Information Officer at Apollo Hospitals and is the driving force behind designing, developing, and deploying clinical AI applications at Apollo Hospitals. Uh, he is a KOL in AI, ML, and analytics in healthcare in this part of the world with research interests uh, across adoption of AI in healthcare, digital health platforms, design thinking in healthcare. And really, uh, he's a leading voice on the transformative potential of technology in medical practice and management. Uh, he has very strictly asked me to keep his intro down to three sentences. So those are the three sentences that I've chosen, but it's my honor to invite him um, to share his views on the transformational role that he believes artificial intelligence, machine learning, and analytics will play a role in healthcare. Dr. Dr. Sujoy, over to you. Thank you, Rohit. I, 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 you had the approval of three words and you went into three sentences, uh, but that's okay. Uh, Rohit uh, is a very dear colleague, he's a younger brother to me. Um, and I would uh, you know, definitely give him that bit of liberty. Um, so thank you very much uh, for joining these webin webinars. Rohit, am I appropriately audible? Am I my screen visible? Yes, your screen is visible. Audio is loud and clear. Unfortunately, we don't have video. No, um, I'm not coming to video today. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so I I'm going to talk a little bit about data-driven solutions for patient safety, which would, in general, uh, uh, talk a little bit about what I perceive uh, from the activity that we are doing at Apollo, how we go about enriching to the last mile, do the health equity bit, 
improve the access uh, with the help of technologies that are available uh, that we design, develop, and deploy, and try to you know take it to not only within the fringes of society but also across the world um, to see um, how it would actually reflect upon in providing care uh, to people with uh, lots of needs and how do we go about in doing that? And that makes the work a little bit difficult because you'll have to understand that health equity is essential to patient safety. And we have to understand it whether technology or technologies like artificial intelligence and all which Puneet was referring, whether you are doing a predictive artificial intelligence or whether you are doing a generative artificial intelligence or whether you're doing a generative on predictive AI, uh, which are now coming up in this way. Um, so I, I didn't have anything in mind when I was uh, coming to for this particular webinar, but I thought I'll pull up some slides from my different talks uh, from different places, including uh, the ones that I give in uh, some of the uh, institutes over India uh, as uh, some of the slides that I will share with you. But health equity, access to care, which is the fundamental to patient safety, has a very steep objective. It talks about absence of unfair, avoidable, or remedial differences in access to care. And for a healthcare organization, these goals are entwined with priorities uh, of human rights, social justice, economic development, and how do you go about in that? But in doing so, you know, one of the bigger hindrances that we are seeing worldwide is that how do you prepare data sets? How do you collect data from your electronic medical records, which are enablers uh, for research, enablers for technology transformation, enablers for how you would go about enrolling this work uh, in your organization. And, you know, in doing many of these, we are in many ways collecting data which are in many forms biased, uh, in silo, the data which does not talk, our data which does not talk to you, uh, data from other institutions, and thereby it is making it very difficult worldwide to actually build, build collaborative research or data consortiums, as I say. But you know, you have to say whenever you are enabling technology to reach to the last mile, you will have to understand that there are very limited amount of people who have access to technologies at this point of time. And I mean, the technology in your hand, your mobile phone, your smartphone, you will have to understand that there are 40% of people who do not have smartphone and who do not have uh, an internet connection. Uh, what is AI that could actually do for them? And you know, these are the people in the fringes of society who required this kind of technology more than ever to actually do that. And therefore, the question is always about, you know, how do you then is AI then stretching the divide of people who would have care and who would not have? Do you see this in the way you develop your algorithms? And then is this you know beginning to uh, make what we call as the algorithmic bias? Um, and how do you define this in terms of fairness, inclusivity, which are very important component of patient safety? And how do you collaborate in bringing in what you do for accountability perspective? And I'll give you a couple of stories. This is something which we saw um, coming out way back in 2018, when um, there was a wonderful AI algorithm for dermatology, which did not diagnose people with black skins appropriately. So, you know, you did a wonderful um, algorithm which could detect skin cancers in fair skins or white skins. But when, it, when you were applying this for, um, you know, someone who has a black skin or a brown skin, uh, you know, it, it is not working. How do you go about in defining this to a woman and her ch child in Tanzania or even for tea garden worker in India? You know, how do you do that? And this is something that you will have to think through when you design, develop AI solutions. This is another study which actually talks about that, you know, people who come and readmit to hospital, some of the algorithms had racial bias saying people with color that they would not actually get readmitted to hospital because the algorithm does not find them suitable enough for readmissions. You know, look at it from a patient safety perspective, how many lives would have been lost 
uh, because they could not get appropriate time to get into a readmission algorithm. Then you look at certain things which are uh, like, uh, you know, my friends at Google who did some wonderful research in diabetic retinopathy over the years. When they started it, rolling it out on the ground, they found out that they had a basic challenge, no internet. And the because there was no internet, the nurses could not upload the images appropriately, and therefore the AI was not working. It's as simple as that. So you may have brilliant algorithms to work with, but if you do not go about in looking at the workflow integration, it will always be challenging and it will always have a difference in the way that you are looking at. Now comes the very important things around the COVID. And you know, in COVID, including my research published in Nature, we had several algorithms running in uh, almost thousand of algorithms that were there to predict AI or catch COVID, uh, predict through AI and catch COVID. And you know, this review by uh, MIT Technology Review actually found out that only two out of those thousand worked. For the rest of the, uh, you know, another thousand, uh, this was completely irrelevant, and then they were uh, not something that was worth mentioning, even in their study on in the research. So you'll have to look at how do you make AI more and more uh, um, important in rolling out in clinical practice. And I'll give you one more example. You know, modern day we talk about generative AI, chat GPTs, and conversational AI, where you can interact with. Um, a, a bot and get about your disease. And I'm particularly worried about my father who stays alone and he, re he, he, he talks to the phone all the time, wants to know about his disease conditions and all that. What is the kind of information that we are giving? What is the kind of communication? You know, communication in patient safety is your IPSG2, which is a very important component of how effective this communication goes from one caregiver to the other. Now, if you take your bot as a caregiver, how is that communication then is getting reflected from the machine to the human and the human in the machine? And what is getting missed out? You have to think about it and see it in that. There are piles of research that uh, we have also contributed, including ones in World Economic Forum, WHO, um, and currently also uh, some of the work that we're doing with uh, for the government of India, where we are talking about how do you bring in the generative AI, the conversational AI, to actually bring it into all of these perspectives. I want to now shift gears and talk about what I teach at I'm Calcutta when um, I talk to my students in, in the perspective of, you know, uh, how you should value in the data, how you value in the data in doing what we call as the disruption in healthcare. And if you look at it, you start with crude data with high volume, velocity, variability, and on scalability, the very definition of big data that you would get. And then you go about in doing nimble experiments I don't think people in quality departments these days do enough experimentation on patient safety, not compromising the patient safety, but to attenuate or enhance patient safety with the help of data regularly. If you do it, please write in your comment section and tell me what you have done, what, is, what was your last research, where did you publish it, and how we can go about in taking that and scaling that up to uh, as many people in doing that. Start with those nimble experimentations. When your nimble experimentations are successful, you move into the scale of what we call as innovation. And innovation needs to be sustained to transform and then make what we call as a disruption. And then you are the next, you know, Apple in your, um, in your, in your industry about how you go about and change. And this is this is a journey. And I always talk about this as a part of this whole thing to challenge people to do this nimble experiments with their data, whether you are doing it in the form of DMAC or lean or TDABC or quality function deployments or your predictive modelings or your genetic modelings, but do it and you know talk about this uh, within your institution and outside your institutions in making this happen. So that brings to the topic that where when I started doing AI, this was my first project uh, where we, I looked at ventilator-associated pneumonia 
and looked at about a very close cohort of patients who would have ventilator-associated pneumonia and what would happen to them on the um, minus two days before uh, the ventilator-associated pneumonia or minus four days uh, before that actual VAP would happen. And excitingly, we found out that, you know, most of the things go wrong around minus four days or minus three days. Uh, and then, you know, you go into a downward uh, the, a downward slide uh, before you get into a VAP. And then, of course, you know about the outcomes. Uh, VAP has a mortality risk of anywhere between uh, 40 to 60 percent, depending on which hospitals you are at what point of time. And then from an analytics perspective, I want to just talk about a story before I get into AI as such. This is a visualization of dengue fever in Kolkata. And this is one of my work that I did with Municipality Department of Kolkata way back in 2013-14, where they came to me and said, you know, uh, after Durga Puja, that is in October, uh, the dengue incidence in Kolkata goes down and its virulence comes down. And we were finding it clinically completely different. And what we did here is to actually look at, this is in 2013, 2014, about 10 years back, 2012, uh, 13, 14, um, and 15, part of 15 at that point of time. To see in the month of August, you would see that there are, these are localities in Kolkata where you would see some incidence of dengue. By September, you see how it goes up increasing. So what we did here, we actually merged ICD-10 coding mapping system and the pin or zip code of, uh, you know, of, of, the, of these people from where they were coming and took them together and put them into an analytic solution to tell you where they were coming. And you can see now in the different localities how it spreads in September, how it again goes up in October, but most definitely it does not end in October, it goes on to November and December. But most importantly, in November, you are now, you are seeing a <clears throat> antigenic shift in the uh, virus, which makes it more lethal. And therefore we find a lot of fatality around in November and December before it actually goes off. So it is not during the Bapuja, but by the time it is Christmas that you would actually see dengue going up. And what this did, what is the impact of the slide? The impact of the slide is that the government uh, and the MCD, sorry, the uh, KMC at that point of time looked at it and said, we need to have dengue control measures around the year. And therefore it changed from four months to 12 months. And by that way, they could save a lot of lives by doing this in that way. So that's the impact that you have when you visualize your data, when you bring your data properly, when you're looking at it from a perspective of health equity and giving uh, a, a understandable insight from what you do in that. Okay, let me now come to what I do for living in terms of design, development, and deployment of clinical AI solution. So we start with a lot of clinical coordination uh, committees for different subjects where we take the data from the EMR, PACS, data warehouse, um, do a lot of extra transform load, harmonize this data, understand the quality of this data, which is very, very important to build ML algorithms and then move on into that. Many organizations build ML algorithms and stop there, but this is where we pickle them and we build API, application programming interface, lacing them or joining them with clinical decision support on top of them and to say, what is the next best action to do this? And then move about and put them into the cloud containers and take them anywhere in the world to uh, for their prospective views or for validations. So the four or five different areas where we are working at this point of time, and some of these are publicly available as APIs. Uh, first one is of course the conversational AI or the SIMPI uh, CDSS that we have on the Apollo 24 seven platform, where you can go and give a symptom and get um, you know, um, a, a diagnosis and take it into a uh, human in the loop that the physician comes in and you then go about and having a conversation with the physician uh, through the virtual consult and get a appointment in that regard. 
the second is the work that we do with the longitudinal data where we bring in, in the concept of disease progression, prevention trajectories, and we do about, you know, how do we prevent cardiovascular disease, prediabetes, liver fibrosis, CKD, stroke, you name it, we have it all. And then the third part is actually going to be uh, around the imaging signals where we, uh, Puneet was talking about, you know, what we do with x-rays, mammograms, ECGs, and also um, some of our algorithms are now in Fitbit uh, and in Apple Watch where you will be able to track them, trace them, and modify your life's behavior going forward. The fourth one is, of course, about the AI augmented pathways, where we you use them as a part of empirical antibiotics, early warning signs, and others, where you are doing this more on bedside care. So let me just quickly go and give you a couple of examples on this. Now, to build them, what you need is a framework. And this is a very important framework. This is a paper we published around how do we, we went about in building this framework and then also going about enrolling this framework out. So you become, bring in the appropriate tenets of ethics from medicine and ethics from AI and join them together to make the first uh, vertical of ease, which is the, uh, the ethical consideration where you are looking at safety and non-maleficence, you are looking at accountability, efficacy, accuracy, integrity, fairness, and inclusivity. On the other hand, you are also looking at what have I made? Is it going to be adopted or used in the uh, clinical flow. So then we begin the con conversation around interoperability, universalization, benchmarking, uh, what is the clinical re relevant outcome and what is the patient safety objective out of it. Uh, but in doing so, you would require an appropriate purpose to move in and what is the clinical need that you are solving uh, or the public health need that you are solving. You saw the example of dengue. Um, and then of course, how do you go about in addressing bias? You look at the practical accuracy and very important topic, which is very, very close to my heart. And we do a lot of research around this is the human machine handoffs. How is human giving machines handoffs and how is machine giving humans in the handoff? So in one of the committees where I uh, also work with Joint Commission and uh, one of the scientists from Joint Commission who is also one of the um, uh, technical people, uh, we are now coming up with certain guidelines which would actually be about uh, the human machine handoffs and machine human handoffs. Uh, though these are guidelines and not standards, but definitely uh, going forward, we would require standards coming out of it. But whatever you build, you need to have an explainable AI perspective. So, you know, it is like creating trust from your algorithms which will explain what the algorithm is all about, what are the values that it's coming out through to the physician who can then go about in relay this to the patients. So there has to be a streamline of trust that has to happen. Otherwise, we know particularly in generative AI that there are examples of what we call as prompt brittleness and hallucinations where you may not get contextually correct information about in using AI, and that becomes dangerous uh, in clinical practice. Um, I'll quickly go around this and show you some of, uh, so one of our latest work was published in BMJ uh, around the cardiac health, uh, about how do we go about in doing this. This is on the right side, you see on the screen, <coughs> excuse me, um, where you can go into the camp and uh, get gather in the camp setting patients data and then AI works at the background to actually provide you the results of it within a span of uh, you know three to four minutes. And they have this in their WhatsApp even before they leave uh, the premises of the camp. And this has now been done over a million people already uh, going ahead. Um, so what we do for, um, you know, in case of, um, you know, in 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 the inpatients and hospitals, which will be more important and interesting to you. So we have an pre-anesthesia algorithms, which has the risk assessment of a tool for surgeries, where we take every parameter that you would normally see in a pre-anesthesia assessment, and uh, we can estimate surgical duration, blood loss, and post-operative patient placement. Uh, this has been built with around close to uh, 3.5 lakhs, around 340 
thousand surgeries, eight locations, 500 plus surgery types of over 18 months, which is currently at an accuracy of 93% and as an R square of 0 0.9. And then we have some work that we have done on early warning signs, which is actually again built on close to 200,000 patient data, about close to 1 billion streaming uh, data that comes from uh, your devices uh, at the periphery. And somebody was talking about remote health and all that. So we have the expertise to now curate the data that is coming out from this devices, put them into an AI algorithm and tell you about early deterioration of a patient 24, 48, 24, 12, 8, and 4 hours before the patient actually deteriorates. Uh, then some work that we did with the ER triage and ICU, which is published in Nature. Again, you can go and have a look at that as well. And then some work that we have been doing with MIT around, you know, whether you are able to predict discharges 24, 48 hours before. And if you are doing that, then can you develop in your own system certain patient safety um, guarded discharge summaries, which has appropriate content and translation and transliteration in their own language uh, using generative AI. So some work uh, that we are doing within ourselves and with our partners going forward. Um, so this is about the AI-based pre-anesthesia algorithms. I spoke about it already. So uh, here are some of the, um, you know, the results that uh, you can see. Uh, we are using a Bayesian neural network now to give an R square between uh, 0 0.92 to 0 0.926, which is um, you know between zero and 100. So you can understand the amount of accuracy that by which we can predict the duration of a surgery uh, given the patient's parameters during the pre-anesthesia and now utilizing it to have a better scheduling of the OR and also to talk about how much blood that patient needs and where the patient would go after the surgery. Um, so this is the app that we currently have where we actually can go about in putting in the data. Uh, this is getting certified already where you are putting in all of the data, including the patient's lab parameters and others. And then of course, you know, you will get at the end of it, a comprehensive uh, result, which is coming out in a pre-anesthesia report, very similar to what you saw uh, in the previous one and gives you a comprehensive report about, um, you know, uh, what is the patient's condition, disease, uh, diagnosis, lab markers and others, and how much uh, duration for the surgery and all of that. Uh, another very important thing from this perspective, from the quality patient safety perspective, is that you do get it completely codified into uh, ICD-10 coding system for any surgery, any diagnosis that you want to bring in into that. Um, I want to quickly move on to early warning signs, and I want to just show you some of the results that we are getting out of the 760 million plus live streaming data that comes from these vitals at the bedside, and then how you go about in looking at it with an accuracy AUC of 0 0.90 and PRC, of course, if you know about it, you know that how difficult it is to get to that level uh, to actually do it um, in-house and build it in that way. Um, and now we are, um, you know, take, giving this to various institutions across the world in US, UK, to actually validate, cross-validate, and come out with uh, results in that way. Uh, very similar to what you saw in pre-anesthesia, you can actually do this also in AI-based early warning system uh, and do that. Uh, I'll just go about and talk a little bit about the research that we're doing on signals. Uh, this is on the ECGs. So we have this in-house capacity now to actually convert a DICOM ECG into an XY coordinate and use them into a large language model. And you can see uh, how this has been done by using uh, generative AI technology that we have built within Apollo hospitals. And uh, we can now use it for clinical decision support, lifestyle modification, or building even heart failure registry. So it's basically all about telling people uh, at least three years or one year before that, you know, uh, there are chances of yours going into heart failure directions and what are the precautions or preventions that you would have to do to do this in that appropriately. Um, I'm going to just quickly finish by giving you a little bit of work that we are doing on chest X-ray and tuberculosis, diagnosing patients both at the bedside and also on the uh, screening programs out with a reduction of 70 28% of turnaround time 
uh, with the 94 to 95% AUC on abnormal chest X-ray and tuberculosis detection. Uh, again, something that we published in Nature. Um, you know, they ran, uh, Stanford ran a study of all the different X-ray algorithms um, across the world at this point of time. And our algorithm that we co-built with Google uh, at this point of time stood the second. We are not the first one, we are the second in that. But uh, from an applicability perspective or workflow integration perspective to do it on the periphery, this is something which is standing out. Um, because Rohit talked about and it's his passion to actually look at it from an oncology perspective, this is the work we have been doing with MIT for more than five years now about detecting breast cancer, early detection of breast cancer by using mammograms and saying prediction of this disease uh, four years, five years before they actually happen. And this is now uh, becoming our standard practice going forward to actually detect these patients and to tell them, you know, what to do next going forward. Uh, this is my last slide. Um, this is work uh, we have been doing on um, antibiotic recommendation system where we are looked at about close to uh, close to 300,000 cultural insensitivity, hammered them with an algorithm very akin to what you see in Netflix, and then put them with a machine learning algorithm on top of it to say at a point of care, what are the possible organisms and which are the possible antibiotics that can actually work on them. So this is Again, something that we are doing uh, prospectively with an accuracy of around 87% to see how it works in this. Um, I would like to end by just asking you this and you know, taking into consideration this five things in AI that is going to come in the future. First of all, we need to change ourselves and we need to put in as you know, Puni talked about, is AI going to take my job? Is it all about taking the job? No, AI is not yet um, even uh, of an order that it can mimic uh, by itself a one-year-old or a two-year-old. So we will have to change the narrative from an AI as a substitute to AI as a complement where we begin to work with AI, uh, particularly in terms of adoption. And then you have to look at your data. Very seriously, you have to look at your data and to see how you go about and contribute to a data consortium rather than anonymized inside, rather than sharing data. And then when you begin to build anonymous you know, data consortiums, you have to understand that that requires improving your computing performance and privacy preserving solutions like federated learning. So what we are doing as a part of research with Microsoft at this point of time is at least two, three steps ahead of modern form of what we know as a federated learning. We call this confidential computing clean rooms, which are about you know, uh, preserving patient privacy and computing on encrypted data to ensure that uh, we do it in an appropriate way. And then of course, to take the entire thing of a human body outside in terms of simulation, uh, what we call as a digital twin uh, to build clinical context and to say for which part of which which drugs in which patient would actually be uh, effective. And then, you know, whether we go about in giving them and seeing clinical results out of it. Finally, we will have, uh, whether today or tomorrow, uh, maybe 50 years down the line, we will have contextualized conscious and attentive machines by the side of the beds, which will work through as a breakthrough in science where they will capture data from us in terms of percept environment actuation and sensing the PS and change the whole concept of what we know as clinical medicine. I'll stop there. And if there are any questions, happy to answer. Thank you, Dr. Sujoy. That was fantastic. Um, I think uh, a lot of use cases that you demonstrated, and I think val capturing of value, there's something uh, that struck with me. And I think one of the questions that we have here relates to that. Do you have any tips um, for uh, implementing AI uh, in the clinical setting um, and challenges maybe you can talk about in terms of privacy, data security, and how, we, how uh, 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 people can overcome it in the clinical setting? Right, that's basically a question summarizing my talk, isn't that? So... <laughs> <laughs> Just the highlights. <laughs> yeah, so, so to put it that way, I think we should begin um, 
in, in the design phase itself and you are designing clinical AI, you need to design it away thinking that at some point somebody is going to use that use that in the bedside and if if it is if it were you uh, how would you do that and how would you like it to be so that is very very important to actually do that so first is to design it in a way where it is um, there is a ease of use there is a complete understanding there is a complete way by which you will be able to explain the particular model uh, to you know to your rest of your clinical colleagues and of course then to the patients in one or the other way about the decision making. So that's uh, in the design, in the explainability perspective that you need to think. The other thing is, you know, um, <clears throat> to, to bring in the first question of ease of use, it is very important that um, we move through the phases of what you are doing at Apollo, you know, the digital transformation bit. Uh, it's it's all of these AI work will always remain fancy and fanciful and then not become uh, a part of practice unless there is a considerable amount of effort that you put in digital transformation. And please understand digital transformation is not equal to digitization or digitalization of your services. Digitization is just scanning your paper record and putting them into some form of uh, you know, digital record. But digital transformation is when you are able to get the insights out of this data and practically, and then go about in implementing them on the ground to change the life of the patient. There is a difference between the two. And I hope each and every one of you are able to take the difference that what is the difference between digitization when you convert your records to you know, digital versus how you convert the insights into clinical practice and change the life of a patient. And there are people who are doing this and there are people who are doing it effectively. In fact, so about four and a, uh, about a couple of weeks back, me and Rohit were in a room where we were hearing a person who does this on a daily basis. And he said, if you are not going to use AI in next five years in certain areas like endoscopy, you will be liable for malpractice. This is where it is leading to. And therefore, uh, I, my appeal to across the board, whether within Apollo or outside Apollo, uh, wherever you are, to actually now begin to realize the importance of using these tools uh, on your daily practice. And these tools will also improve as you practice to, in order to you know, bring the change in the life that, uh, of patients that we're talking about. And bring the changes in the life of yourselves. Yeah, that's fantastic. So I think you know the key point that you talked about is about AI becoming an imperative for patient safety rather than just a nice to have and a fanciful tool in a doctor's toolkit. I think it's moving towards becoming an essential toolkit. Um, and another question that we have is on uh, the usefulness of AI in uh, in in the active patient record documentation process. Um, anything that you'd like to talk about, Dr. Yeah, John? Rohit, you know, you know, Rohit, I would love to hear your perspective on this because you know there are so many ways by which there are augmentation of patient records either by using auditory AI or using generative AI, go about and tell your story about this, Rohit. So I think two, two aspects here, one of the uh, key things that you highlighted in your talk was about having good, rich data. And I think we've moved uh, uh, technologically from requiring data to be in very structured format to be able to really leverage unstructured data. So providing clinicians with speech-to-text tools, something that we do here at Apollo at scale, um, where clinicians can dictate notes rather than have to type it in, um, provides not just fantastic uh, records for uh, clinical management and patient safety, but also uh, provides great data for all of our LLMs to work on new models that are coming up to work on. So having that, you know, providing that aspect of rich data through AI 
to be speech to text it could be interpretive ambient ai it could be a uh, you know a predictive text that's allowing doctors to to uh, to to just copy paste rather than uh, have to generate the content themselves is really a way of ensuring that our data quality is is improving quite rapidly for um, ai to consume and this becomes effectively a flywheel that's really the the experience I, that i want to talk but, about and i think yeah, is really no, critical i want i want to bring in a perspective of caution and uh, let puit puni also join the conversation you know when you and this is for everyone when you test something with generative ai uh, i would i would my advice would be that you should always look at the data from where they're fetching the information uh, on a common ground they do excellent uh, when you are fetching data of, to a being about you know about certain things that you want to know they do it in that way but from a clinical gate great perspective as on today whether it is the open ai generative ai copilot and others or the metpharms and others they are not yet patient great they don't claim themselves to be patient great and to make them patient great what you require is to go about in putting what i call as differentiated database which is a highly curated data set which has a very rich clinical you know uh, clinical practice related data that are there which are curated from your emr and then they provide insights into particular treatment or diagnosis and others and if that is laid upon the responses of generative ai then it will make it substantially strong what they have currently i doubt thank you yeah i think i think guardrails are important um you know conversational ai is great uh, but when it comes to core clinical information it definitely needs to be coming from a differentiated uh, database that uh, uh, you know clinical teams are also uh, involved in generating looking keeping enriching etc so i think we've had a fantastic session we've run out of time uh but everyone on the call here thank you so much i'd like to extend my sincere thanks to dr sujoy and dr puneet for two fantastic very insightful presentations participants you can look us up on linkedin and connect us on, connect with us on linkedin if you have more questions uh want some inspiration motivation or some ideas in terms of how you can use ai um in uh, clinical practice and uh, uh patient care and we'll be more than happy to engage on that um finally as a preamble to THIT 2024 do make sure that you register uh, we'll have well, a lot it is of IPSC it is IPSC 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 part of okay <laughs> IPSC 11th IPSC edition um uh, do do be part of that uh are we going to have more discussions on emerging technologies in patient safety and patient care and we hope to see as many of you there as possible thank you everyone and thank you to the uh, speakers for a fantastic session thanks thanks roy thank you everyone thanks joy thank you bye